Hey, everybody, we're here talking about NFTs. What is it? How will it change our lives? We're here with Dave Steenberg. Dave, thanks for joining us. Hey, Josh, thanks for having me. Okay, so tell us, why are we here talking to you about NFTs? Well, I've been a crypto enthusiast for over 10 years. I bought my first Bitcoin back in 2012 for $80. Bought my first Ethereum back in the day for $15. And ever since then, I have climbed down the crypto rabbit hole with great enthusiasm with everything around DeFi to smart contracts to NFTs. Awesome. Yeah, I will say for those watching, I listen to everything Dave has to say. Uh, he is a, a one of the, the, the people that we all know. We all have somebody in our lives that's if they're really into whiskey, they're going to know everything about whiskey. If they're into crypto, they're going to know everything about crypto. Dave researches and over researches and has really come away with such a refined and deep knowledge in the space. So I thought it was a great chance to have somebody who can really bridge the gap from somebody who, who understands and is around people who don't know what they're talking about, like myself, um, to the people who are really engaged in the process. So, Dave, thanks again for breaking it down. We have one major question, obviously. What are NFTs go? What are NFTs? Well, NFT is an acronym. It stands for non-fungible token. So the first question is, what does fungible even mean? A uh, way to think about it is fungibility is uniqueness, or on the other end, how generic is something. So let's say the US dollar. The US dollar is completely fungible. A dollar is a dollar is a dollar. If, Josh, you got a call in the middle of the night from your bank, you're tired, you're sleeping, they wake you up, and they say, hey, we were doing a software upgrade, and for a half second, $1,000 disappeared from your account, but don't worry, we replaced it. You would be like, great, why'd you even wake me up? Nobody cares, thank you. You wouldn't say, well, wait a minute, is it the exact same $1,000 that was in there? Is it the same collection of ones and zeros that was in there before, nobody cares. That's complete fungibility. The dollar is generic, right? Let's go on the other end, non-fungible. So non-fungible would mean it's not generic. In fact, it's unique. And to think of an extreme example of something that's utterly unique and irreplaceable, let's say you have a love letter from your spouse when you were newlyweds that's handwritten and uh, written the night before your marriage and your spouse has now passed away, right? If someone were to give you that letter and it was typed out, would that be the same? Absolutely not. If you hired a forger to duplicate your spouse's handwriting and repeat everything on that letter, would that still be the same? No, because it what didn't come from your spouse. It's not unique and it's not imputed with value. So that would be complete non-fungibility. It's utterly unique and irreplaceable. So what does that mean as far as crypto and NFTs? What it means that is our technology through the blockchain, particularly right now Ethereum, has reached a point where we can assign that uniqueness to a digital good, or we can assign it to a digital good tied to a physical good. So now with a digital item, you can prove uniqueness or at the you know, on another level, at least limited edition availability. Can you give us an example of how people are using NFTs today? Sure. Well, at a very simple level, you have people that are minting JPEGs, very simple, low quality, uh, high granular or low granularity pieces of art, and they're throwing them up on OpenSea and hoping to flip them for some amount of profit, right? 98, 99% of those will go to zero. On the other end, you have NFTs that have actual utility. Uh, one that comes to mind would be Board Ape Yacht Club or Cyber Kongs, where entire communities and entire metaverse type environments are being built around these. And in that case, it's the scarcity, which is a key part of NFTs, and it's the community that gives those NFTs value. Okay, so before we dive down that rabbit hole, let's just talk about a lot of people using NFTs when it comes to art. That's what, what people almost think now NFT is synonymous with art. But moving forward into the future, how is that going to change? Obviously, the technology, the ability to have something be non-fungible and tracked um, is, is a powerful technology. But how is it going to be used beyond art? Yeah, that's a good question. I would uh, say right now the NFT space is really akin to Web 1.0 where it was just static web pages. It was kind of slow. Nobody really knew where it was going. No one could forecast 
20 years ago what the value of the internet would be as far as web 2.0 with interaction, right? And now as we're approaching web 3.0 with autonomy and um, uh, digital ownership. But going back to the original web 1.0, you know, those were static pages and there was no interaction and there was no community. We're kind of in the end uh, range of that with NFTs right now. In terms of where it could go, it will change the world. NFTs will create a new economy and to miss that train would be like missing the train of the internet back in 1995. You had certain people that saw the future, people that saw where things were going, Jeff Bezos, Mark Cuban with AudioNet, things like that. And then you had a whole crowd of people that thought it was just an absolute waste of time and worthless because they couldn't see the potential of it. Well, the potential with NFTs is proof of ownership. And right now, a killer app for NFTs, if you will, is royalties. So you can apply that to music, you can apply that to movies, you can apply that to books, you can apply that to entertainment. That whole idea of royalties in perpetuity written into a smart contract that's immutable and unhackable will create entire new business models that right now we can't even begin to conceive of, though we are seeing small inklings of what it could mean. So I'll give you some of that inkling. So everyone, so Dave and I went to the uh, NYC.NFT conference. He called me up and said, hey, I'm going to New York to this conference. Uh, and I said, great, uh, I'm there. What, what are NFTs? And so I, in the process, learned a few things. So one of the things that I walked away with, with what uh, Dave's talking about now is if an artist, for example, produces a product and sells it as an NFT, as a digital asset to someone else, and that person then goes on to sell it, and that person, and that person, and that person, every time that sale gets made, because you're able to track it, the original artist is able to build in, if they like to, part of their contract is every time they, somebody else sells their product, they get a percentage of that. Obviously in perpetuity or to every extent or derivative that you'd like, but imagine that if, if Van Gogh's, uh, let's see, kids were able to now be making money off of the artwork that he has, you know, generations later, they'd probably be, um, well, probably, frankly, would be very unsuccessful and lazy right now because that's what generations do when they can get money off of their grandparents. So in the spirit of making future generations lazy and um, a totally non-utilitarian, think about NFTs in terms of an artist, right? And the ethos around that is that creators deserve to be compensated. And right now, what does that model look like? It looks like a lot of intermediaries. It looks like a lot of what are called rent seekers that basically seek to extract value and compensation from a creator for the privilege of being distributed on their network, right? YouTube being a prime example of one where the creator gets a small, small amount of all the ad revenue that they generate. Well, now if you could go to a decentralized model, something where you're disintermediating, which is a key crypto ethos, you're disintermediating those uh, rent seekers basically. And now you as a creator, you own the value of your work. And that value can be transacted directly to you through electronic wallets and smart contracts. And not only that, if say Josh Halpern creates a limited edition video series of only a thousand views, there you go. And people want to start trading that. You could NFT your video and people could trade videos of Josh or whoever, and every time it's traded, every time it's bought, you get a royalty of that in perpetuity. It's written into the smart contract. In a sense, it's hard coded. It can't be changed. It can't be hacked. And you could even pass that onto your children as part of your estate who could then pass it on to their grandchildren. And at a fundamental level, what makes something valuable is scarcity. And let me give you an example. Uh, let's say you have a Taylor Swift vinyl, right? And it's one that was uh, pressed back in the day when they were pressing lots of vinyls, you know, in the millions and millions, or maybe it's a CD that was pressed and there's millions of millions of out there and you can trade one for another, you can sell them on eBay. If you do sell on eBay, Taylor Swift gets none of those royalties, right? It's the rule of the first sale, which is what the artists tend to get in uh, music. Well, now you're in a streaming world where you can NFT something and digitally trace something, right? Well, what if that pressed vinyl you had, what if that CD you had was autographed by Taylor Swift? Well, now it's unique. Now it's not like any of the other ones out there and you can sell that for exponentially more than what the unautographed uh, vinyl would sell for. So one way to think about the NFT isn't the art itself, it's like the signature, it's the autograph. 
It's the proof of scarcity, which is what her signature on a vinyl album is. It's a proof of scarcity. And if it's endorsed by the artist, that imputes value to it. So now she, now the artist, we'll just say generically, releases a new album, but 1,000 um, albums are NFT'd. And now with that NFT, you can assign rights and privileges to that. Front row seating at a concert, 15 minutes with the artist. There's all these other ancillary benefits that you can tie to an NFT that um, is provably yours. And then you can sell that, and in the act of selling that, the artist gets a royalty, 1%, 2%, 10%, whatever they negotiate to the contract, without having to rely on an army of attorneys and auditors and the trust that if their song is played someplace in South Korea on a streaming service, they're actually going to get their check six months later. Now it's automatic, it's instant, it's verifiable, it's traceable. And once again, we've disintermediated all these middle persons that want to take a cut of the artist's revenue. And you can extend that to real estate. You can extend that to book publishing. You can extend that to business models that, again, we haven't even begun to mine uh, the opportunities in. Amazing. Okay, everybody, I think that's enough for today. We're going to digest this. Uh, Dave, again, thanks for helping break some of that down. And we have some sure more questions coming in, and we'll come back to you soon. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Remember, follow us, subscribe, so you can learn more about the ever-changing landscape of digital trade, e-commerce, and now NFT land. Talk to you soon.